And we are uh, pleased to have again with us Professor Bruce McCormack, Charles Hodge, Professor of Systematic Theology at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, last night, those of you who were able to uh, be there heard it. a lecture which was interesting at various levels, uh, interesting for both historians, biblical scholars, and theologians, and I'm sure we'll be treated to more of the same today. Um, so let's welcome Dr. Bruce McCormack. Is this on? Am I wired up too loud? Uh, please forgive me, forgive me for sitting. Um, I have four slip discs in my lower back, and I think it would have been fine if I were just doing one lecture, but to do two standing would probably invite all kinds of problems that nobody wants to have happen. So um, I'm going to make like Augustine and sit while I lecture. Uh, the other thing I want to say is uh, two lectures back to back, I'm probably going to uh, get a dry throat very quickly, so I'm going to pause frequently uh, to uh, refresh myself, and in so doing, I'll probably give you a, a chance to uh, catch up with me and figure out what's going on. Okay, the title of this lecture is From the One God to the Trinity, the Creation of the Orthodox Understanding of God. Let me just remind you where we are in the structure of this lecture series. Uh, I told you last night I'm going to start with historical development and treat the doctrine of God in the ancient world and in the modern world in these two lectures. I'm going to treat biblical materials uh, tomorrow, and the constructive work is all defer deferred till next week to lectures five through seven. <clears throat> The emergence of what Lewis Ayers has called pro-Nicene theology in the 360s has a lengthy prehistory. It is a history which begins not with Arius, but with earlier attempts going back to the early 3rd century at the very latest to address questions surrounding the nature and knowability of God. The issues dealt with by the architects of the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity presupposed a basic understanding of what it meant to be God. Terms like simplicity and impassibility were central to a vocabulary shared by all the combatants, both orthodox, not so orthodox, heretical, in the late fourth century. To be sure, disagreements continued to arise with regard to their entailments. But by the late fourth century, the basic elements of Christian theism had become so firmly established that one could not make progress in addressing the Trinitarian problem without constantly attending to them. What this suggests is that the received doctrine of God set the terms to a large degree for the ways in which debates over the Trinity would unfold. I mention this because the progression in thought in the modern period would be the exact reverse. For most modern theologians, and Schleiermacher constitutes an exception here, one begins with the doctrine of the Trinity. If, after having established what can be known of the triune God, one could say something about the being and attributes of God, well and good. But Karl Barth was not alone in insisting on the primacy of the Trinity. All those who stood in the shadow of Hegel did much the same. In the early church, it was not so. The explanation for this is not a simple one. Certainly it had a great deal to do with the fact that the New Testament writers protested their ongoing faith in the one God of Israel, even as they engaged in and encouraged the worship of Jesus as Lord. But it also had to do with the spread of the gospel into the surrounding Hellenistic culture. With the advent of persecution, the apologists of the second and third centuries adopted many of the stratagems of earlier Jewish apologist, apologists, insisting, for example, that their wisdom was not esoteric, but compatible with much that had been taught by the very best Greek philosophers, that their wisdom was actually older than that of the pagans, antiquity being understood to be a strong argument for truth claims, that Christians were not a threat, but made good citizens, etc., as I say, all of this was the standard stuff of Jewish uh, apologetics. 
It is a fact whose significance should not be underestimated that the earliest Christian doctrinal theologies took the form of apologies. For the apologetic task, as then conceived, had a built-in tendency to give prominence to areas of agreement between Christians and pagans, while adjusting elements peculiar to Christian faith to those shared commitments. Such a move was not cynical, however. It was not undertaken on the grounds of expedience alone. Many of the apologists had first been trained in the field of philosophy. Justin Martyr provides a good case in point. God, for Justin, is uncreated and impassable, ineffable, and therefore without name, ingenerate, the creator of all things in heaven and earth. Justin had no concept of the Father, understood as a distinct person of the Trinity. When he spoke of the Father, he simply equated him with the Godhead from which the Son is derived. Justin interpreted the relation of the word to God with the help of a Stoic distinction between the imminent word, the logos and dia thetos, and the word uttered or expressed, the logos proforikos. By nature, the word is imminent to God, as God's thought or mind, Justin said. The word was begotten or uttered for the purpose of serving as the agent of creation and revelation. Thus, the beginning, of the, the beginning of the word was, for Justin, an act of divine willing. It was not necessary. Here already a crucial distinction between God and the Logos emerged, which is of relevance for understanding Justin's conception of the being of God as such. The God who appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre in Genesis 18 was, Justin said, to be distinguished as another from the one who remains ever in celestial places, invisible to all men, holding personal intercourse with none, whom we believe to be maker and father of all things." Unquote. It should be noted that although Justin clearly subordinated the word to God, this was offset to some degree by his belief that the begetting of the Son was purely spiritual in nature. That is to say, there is no separation of the word from God as a consequence of the begetting. Justin appealed to the analogy of fire in order to explain this. When fire kindles a second fire, the first is not diminished thereby, but remains the same. Moreover, the Logos remains in God even as he is uttered forth, so that he too is indivisible and inseparable from God. What is clear is that Justin takes the nature of God largely for granted. He assumes his pagan readers will, for the most part, agree with his description. And if his treatment of the begetting of the Son could then be shown to be compatible with this shared description, if it leaves that picture undisturbed, then he will have succeeded in showing the compatibility of Christian belief with pagan wisdom. Thus, the fixed pole in Justin's reflections, if you will, was his understanding of the nature of God. His attempt to say something about the relation of the Son to the Father was adjusted to it. My point in all of this is that Justin's procedure was not unique to him. It constituted standard practice as debates over the Trinity moved to center stage in the fourth century. The historical unfolding of the orthodox doctrine of God moved from the one God to triunity, not the other way around. This particular lecture will be divided into two major sections. The first will treat of the twin concepts of simplicity and impassibility, the first of which especially would play an enormous role in fourth century reflection on the doctrine of the Trinity. I'm including impassibility here because it is a necessary corollary of simplicity, a commitment in the absence of which simplicity would be undermined. Critical consideration of these concepts is also much needed today, now more than ever. Simplicity and impassibility have made a huge comeback in recent years, after a lengthy period of time in which even the most eminent patristic scholars found them deeply problematic. 
The fact that proponents of these concepts in the Protestant churches especially today are now increasingly dismissive, dismissive of critics of them, and even derisive, tells us a lot about their sense of where things are headed in church and theology. Clearly, today's advocates of these concepts understand their, their tribe to be in the ascendancy, so much so that they can assume a level of agreement amongst their readers which requires little, if any, defense. Simplicity and impassibility have become the new orthodoxy, and like most orthodoxies, we would do well not to simply take them for granted. In the second major section, I will turn to an examination of the pro-Nicene theology embodied in the Creed of Count Constantinople of 381. For the purposes of this lecture, this section can be quite brief. I'll be expanding upon it in the published version. I turn then first to a brief history of the Christian uses of the concept of simplicity and impassibility. The heading of this first major section is Constitutive Features of Classical Theism, Two Leading Concepts. Subpoint A, God as Simple. The word simplicity means basically without parts or composition. Now that might seem innocent enough. After all, John 4.24 tells us that God is spirit, which would seem to point towards immateriality and incline us in the direction of non-composition. But the word simplicity never met, meant that alone. From the beginning, it had a much wider significance. It also carried the implication that the apparently diverse attributes people customarily ascribe to God are not really diverse after all, or at least not diverse in the way the properties of objects of our ordinary experience are diverse. Thus, the affirmation of divine, and divine simplicity immediately raises the question of the relation of the attributes of God to the divine essence, or whatness, of God, and to each other. Are the attributes merely conceptual devices by means of which Christians describe God's diverse activities in relation to this world? Or do they faithfully and accurately describe God's true nature as it is in himself? And if they do, how do they do that? Are they somehow identical with the divine essence? Is each genuine attribute a description of the divine essence as a whole? Are they, in fact, synonyms, different names for what amounts to the same thing? These are the questions raised by the affirmation of divine simplicity, and it is interesting to see how the different answers given to them by the fathers themselves impacted the decisions they made in other areas of doctrinal reflection. The concept of simplicity can already be found in the writings of the pre-Christian Jewish philosopher-theologian Philo of Alexandria. Philo thought himself to, to find a biblical warrant for it in the Septuagint translation of Exodus 3.14 and 15, I am he who is, though it is not clear that he was right about that. For even in its Septuagintal form, which constitutes an expansion on the Hebrew text, it is more likely that the rendering was meant only to affirm that God's being is unchangeable. Simplicity is one and quite possibly two steps removed conceptually from immutability, depending upon whether impassibility is introduced as a mediating term. I will have more to say about that in the next subsection. Suffice it here to say that the real source of these ideas is to be found in the Platonic theory of forms, which by Philo's time had been, according to Andrew Radegolvitz, arranged in an order of increasing generality, which culminated in a single principle, which was both pure being and pure goodness, unquote. In the second century AD, Ptolemy the Gnostic proposed yet another entailment of the concept of simplicity. Ptolemy distinguished a 
first God, who is simple in nature, and a second God, who is complex. He did so because being simple, the first God could only act simply. That is to say, a simple God could only engage in a singular, non-complex activity. But causal activity in relation to the world of matter is necessarily multiple, because the matter by which the world is constituted divides. Hence the need for a second God who is complex, at least at the level of power, if not of substance. A simple God cannot create a sen sensible world. Now the effects of this kind of thinking are still manifest in Origen's doctrine of the Trinity in the third century, a point to which we will return. In his fine study of simplicity in the early church, Radigalvis demonstrates that prior to the Cappadocians, there were basically two options where the implications of simplicity for the knowledge of God was concerned. Radical apophaticism on the one side and the identity thesis on the other. In his view, what bound these highly divergent views together was a common commitment to what he calls the epistemological priority of definition. That is to say, the view that to know something meant to be able to state what kind of thing it is. In other words, its essence. If then to know God is to know God in his essence, to know what God is essentially, then either one concluded that we humans could not possibly know an absolutely simple being, the essence of God lying beyond our epistemic reach, or one claimed that in knowing the properties of God, we do indeed know God's essence, since essence and attributes are one in him. The overarching thesis of Roddy Galditz's book is that Basil of Caesarea and Gregory of Nyssa bid firm farewell to the epistemological priority of definition, and in, in doing so, open the door to the transformation of the doctrine of divine simplicity. A third view missed in most studies of this theme. I will return to this third way in a moment. For now, let's explore the two options available to theologians prior to the 360s in greater detail. First then, radical apophaticism. Clement of Alexandria held that a truly stringent account of simplicity would have to lead to the conclusion that the one is without qualities and therefore completely inexpressible. Quoting Clement, For how could one express that which is neither genus nor difference, nor species nor individual, nor number? And neither is it any accident nor anything in which an accident exists. Nor would one rightly call it a whole, for the whole is applied to magnitude, and he, God, is the father of the whole. Nor ought one to say that there are any parts of it, for the one is indivisible, and therefore it is without form and nameless. Unquote. How did Clement arrive at this conception? By a series of negations illustrated by a geometric analogy. Clement wrote, Extract from body its physical properties, taking away the di dimension of depth, then that of breadth, and then that of length. The point which remains is, as it were, a unit having position. Now take away its position, and you get the conception of unity. Unquote. Origin of Alexandria, one time student of Clements, would say much the same thing. For him, God is, in a very real sense, beyond being. Quoting Origin, God does not even participate in being. For he is participated in rather than participates. Unquote. It is the only begotten Son who is, quote, the being of beings, or more literally, the substance of substances and the idea of ideas, 
but his father transcends all these. Origen was quite willing to use the category of substance to speak of the son, but he was very chary about using it in relation to the father. Now, all of this has Trinitarian implications, quite obviously. The father alone is simple. The son is, to use Origen's memorable phrase, multiplex in constitutione. For Origen, the titles, the New Testament biblical titles or epinoiae, by means of which witnesses given to Christ in the New Testament, are both subjective and objective. That is to say, they are human ways of viewing Christ, but they also have their corollary in his being. Origen organized these epinoiae into two classes. The first class belonged to him as the mediator of creation and, as a consequence, are constitutive of his being. The second class are soteriological in nature, describing what Christ is for us as Savior in the economy of God. To the first class belong wisdom, word, life, and truth. As wisdom, the Son is the repository of the pre-existent ideas, the forms of all created things and the pattern according to which they were created. As word, the Son is the rationality imminent in human beings. To the second class of epinoiae belong the following. Resurrection, good shepherd, vine, door, etc. There is no plurality of epinoiae in God the Father since he is utterly simple. The Son, however, is a multiplicity by nature. Now, much like Justin before him, Origen understood the Son to remain in the Father even as he goes forth from him. Thus, the Son participates in the utter simplicity of the Father even as he is made to be a multiplicity. This multiplicity is therefore purely spiritual in character in accordance with the fact that the eternal generation of the Son is itself a holy spiritual or, we might say, an intellectual act. That having been said, the, the Son clearly differs from the Father substantially in Origen's thinking. That is to say, he differs from the Father in nature. Such difference is muted by the idea of participation, but it remains. And that's quite intentional on Origen's part. For only in this way is Origen able to explain how it comes about that God is able to create the world. The utterly simple Father cannot create directly since he cannot come into direct contact with the world of multiplicity. Only a son who is a multiplicity by nature can act causally in relation to a pluriform world without ceasing to be what he is. Moreover, the father cannot begin to do anything without involving himself in change. Quoting Origen, that singular and holy intellectual existence, that is to say, God, can admit no delay or hesitation in any of its movements or operations. For if it did so, the simplicity of the divine nature would appear to be in some degree limited and impeded by such an addition. And that which is the first principle of all things would be found to be composite and diverse and would be many and not one, unquote. Thus, the generation of the Son and the creation of the world must be seen as one and the same eternal event. The Father creates by generating the Son to be his creative power. taking a step back, it should be noted that not many Christians will be satisfied with a view which suggests that the first God is unknowable, and that the one to whom the attributes so richly attested in Holy Scripture belong is, in fact, a subordinate being. And the problem here is not merely subordinationism. The problem has to do with trust. Trust that what the Scripture says of God is finally true. If the Father is truly formless and nameless, as Justin and Clement and Origen say, then even the name Father does not really apply, 
not even analogically. In Radha Galvitz's account, the second pre-Cappadocian option is to say that God's simplicity requires that any names which are truly proper to God must name the divine essence. This is what he calls the identity thesis, and he finds it espoused by both Athanasius and Eunomius, albeit in differing ways and with widely diverging results. For Athanasius, the pressure to understand the names given to God in Scripture as naming the divine essence comes from debates over the Trinity. Athanasius was quite concerned to understand the name of Father as a proper name, which also meant, given that the Father is not a Father without the Son, that the relation of Father and Son is in fact essential to God. Whether one could say that the Father and the Son belong to the essence of God without undermining simplicity is a question for which Athanasius himself did not have, in my judgment, a fully adequate answer. The Cappadocians would have a more well-worked-out answer than Athanasius did. Lewis Ayers writes, quote, There are for Athanasius no qualities in God, and thus God's name and essence are not distinct. But when we speak of God's essence, we do no more than say that God is. We do not know what God is. Unquote. If this is correct, then to name God Father, for example, would tell us nothing with respect to what God is. I would like to suggest that if Father and Son name a completely unknown divine essence, then we will not have gotten very far past Clement of Alexandria which seems to me to belie what Athanasius would like to achieve with his version of the identity thesis. It's clear enough, though, what Athanasius hoped to achieve with all this. He wanted to make the relation of father and son to be proper to an utterly simple God so that he could then maintain that the relation itself was utterly incomposite. The effort expended by Athanasius to save the doctrine of simplicity from the pressure applied to it by the triunity of God was considerable. I will return to the question of whether it is possible to save simplicity from that pressure without drifting willy-nilly into modalism in the final section of this lecture. The pressure to adopt the identity thesis came, in the case of Eunomius, from the attributes rather than from the triunity of God, as was the case with Athanasius. Eunomius saw clearly what Clement failed to see. Namely, that if the language we use to speak of God is only finally self-referential, talk about ourselves, then we are, of all people, most to be pitied. But Eunomius also believed that if the divine essence and the divine attributes are identical, and if the divine attributes are, in fact, multiple, then the essence cannot be simple, which for him, too, is unthinkable. His solution was a radical one. He made all genuine attributes, such as light and life, to be identical with the one most basic property of the divine essence, namely its ingeneracy. Radigalditz calls this the synonymity principle, meaning all the attributes are synonyms, finally, for the same thing, namely ingeneracy. Seen in one light, Eunomius' expansion of the identity principle by means of the synonymity principle is completely understandable. If one is going to embrace the identity principle at all, then some explanation had to be found for why the diversity of attributes does not lead to composition in the divine essence. Eunomius achieved this with his synonymity principle. A quite different solution would later be proposed by the Cappadocians. But the real problem with Eunomius lay in his identification of the divine essence with ingeneracy. The problem is twofold. First, if the father is ingenerate and the son generate, then the son is quite clearly of a different essence than the father. But that's just the most obvious problem. The other problem lies in the fact that a mode of origination, as it would later come to be called, tells us how a thing is or comes to be, 
but it tells us nothing with respect to what a thing is. The Cappadocians would later assign modes of origination to the hypostases rather than to the essence, which neatly eliminated the ontological otherness of the Son in relation to the Father, created by the eunomian equation of ingeneracy with the essence of the Father. This move would also give rise to new questions to which we will return in due course. We are now prepared to undertake an examination of the Cappadocian Third Way, at least as explained by Rada Galvitz. <clears throat> I do have, just to help you to understand what I'm about to do, have serious questions about whether there really is a Third Way, and you'll see that as I develop the analysis. The transformation of the concept of divine simplicity carried out by Basil the Great and Gregory of Nyssa, according to Rada Galvitz, has to do with the joining of a positive conception of simplicity to the received negative one. A negative concept tells us what something is not, rather than what it is. And so a negative conception of simplicity says, not composite. But it really tells us nothing beyond that. The Cappadocians will now seek to give positive content to the conception. For Basil and Gregory, there is a distinct class of core attributes which do indeed succeed in naming the divine essence. Gregory includes in this list the following items. Light, wisdom, power, life, truth, justice, goodness, and incorruptibility. The last of which means something like moral purity in spite of its negative form so that it, too, turns out to be a positive concept. Of these, goodness seems to have been most basic. Though the meanings assigned to the other terms are not in the least reducible to the meaning of this one. Gregory is adamantly opposed to the eunomian synonymity principle. He understands these goods, as he calls them, to be genuinely multiple. So how do these goods relate to each other, and how do they relate to the divine essence? The first of these questions is more easily answered than the second. Gregory holds with Basil that each of the goods taken individually are predicated of the whole of the divine substance, rather than referring to an aspect of it. More importantly, however, the goods are interrelated, so that no single one of them can be what it is in the absence of all the others. That is to say, each stands in a relation of reciprocity to all the others. And so, for example, God would not be perfectly good were he not also perfectly wise, perfectly just, etc. It is this move above all which contributes to Gregory's positive account of simplicity as entailing the pure, perfect possession of all the goods. If each good names the whole of the divine substance in its reciprocal unity with all the others, then, so the argument goes, the commitment to divine simplicity is faithfully maintained. Simplicity on this showing refers to unmixed divine perfection. So how then do these goods relate to the divine essence? The reason that this question is not easily answered is that Gregory himself seems to vacillate between two possible explanations. He holds first that the goods are rightly understood to be propria of the divine nature because they inherit in that nature. Talk of propria, according to Rade Goldwitz, occupies an in-between ground between mere conceptualization by human beings and an attempt to define the divine essence. One reason for this is that the list of propria offered by Gregory is treated by him as open-ended, so that a complete definition of the divine essence does not result from the highly realistic way in which the propria are predicated of the divine essence. The propria do enable us to know something about what God is, essentially, but they do not define the divine essence. 
they do not able us enable us to comprehend God. Okay, so far so good. But just here, a certain amount of equivocation enters the picture. For according to Roddy Galvez, Gregory also wants to say, secondly, that, quote, God and goodness or the goods are distinct in the sense that the divine nature or essence is distinct from each of the goods and from the whole set taken together, unquote. Gregory, on Roddy Galvez's account, introduces a distinction between the essence, the toti, of the divine substance and the propria of that substance. Or more simply, a distinction between the divine essence and the divine substance. Now, a distinction between essence and substance is going to seem a rather strange to most of us. If it were meant to be equivalent to the difference between complete definition and incomplete definition, then it would not be a problem. For then it would be a linguistic cue only a way of gesturing towards the incompleteness and impermanency of our knowledge of God. But, if this linguistic device were intended to indicate an ontological difference between divine essence and divine substance, then we would indeed have problems. But that is precisely what happens when Radha Galvitz ascribes to Basil in particular a, quote, absolute agnosticism, unquote, with respect to to what it is, the what it is of God, the toti of God, the divine essence. A complete agnosticism with respect to the divine essence. For if we possess some knowledge of divine substance, but no knowledge whatsoever of divine essence, then the distinction between them has to be ontological in nature. I'm quite sure that Radek Alvitz does not intend an ontological distinction. He's told me as much in an email exchange. But if the distinction is linguistic only and intended simply to say that we possess real knowledge of the divine being in, say, albeit an incomplete knowledge, then why not simply say that? Why not just replace the misleading distinction between essence and substance with a distinction between a completed definition of essence or substance, since they're the same thing, and an incomplete definition? Well... The reason is that Radha Galvez is looking for a third way, a positive definition of simplicity. In any event, there are times when Gregory's achievement seems to consist, pace Radha Galvez, not in a third way at all between radical apophaticism and the identity thesis, but rather in an embrace of both by means of the essence and substance distinction. And where that suspicion dawns, then Gregory begins to lose coherence. The deepest lying problem here, it seems to me, lies in Gregory's desire to adhere to the axiom of his forebears, namely, that we can know that God is, but not what God is. At his best, he departs from this rather unfortunate formula, insisting that knowledge of the propria is indeed knowledge of the divine essence, albeit of a limited kind. But then the apophatic bug bites him again, and we are often running into the great unknown. Gregory could have solved all these problems, it seems to me, by saying that the peculiar properties of the Father, Son, and Spirit taken together simply are the divine essence. That words like Father and Son are just as descriptive, and even more so, than words like goodness. Instead, we are left with an unknowable essence distinguishable from the persons in relation an indivisible monad alleged to be imminent in the persons and inseparable from from them. Simplicity functions for the most part as the last and final guardian of that monadic unity. (coughs) God as impassable. The concept of divine simplicity (coughs) stands or falls with divine impassibility. That does not mean that impassibility is more basic. In fact, I don't think it is. It simply means that simplicity requires impassibility. For if God were truly passable, if God were affected or conditioned on the level of his being by what takes place in this world, his nature would have to be composite in some sense of that word. That the twin commitments of simplicity and impassibility would have profound implications for Christology is obvious. 
the fact that Christian theism was fully formed by the mid-third century, a full two centuries before the Christological settlement of Chalcedon in 451, makes it unsurprising that later Christological reflection should have taken place under the constraints provided by an understanding of divine being, which by that time was largely taken for granted. <clears throat> Impossibilitas is a Latin translation of the Greek word apatheia, from which we get the English word apathy. Applied to God, apatheia might seem to imply <clears throat> excuse me, an absence of emotions and an indifference to human life in this world. But etymology, as Paul de Brilliuk reminds us, cannot decide the meaning of the term as it was actually employed by the church fathers. The fathers did not deny to God all emotions. They simply denied to him those emotions which they regarded as unworthy of him. And they certainly did not think of God as indifferent to life in this world. God's providential care for the world was constantly affirmed. The central point in the concept is that the being of God is not conditioned by anything outside of itself. Now, there is a grain of truth in that claim, insofar as conditioning might be thought to imply dependence. God is most certainly not dependent for what he does or is on the world. But it's at least conceivable that a willingness to allow himself to be affected, which in my mind is a preferable word to the word condition, a willingness to allow himself to be affected by what happens in this world at the deepest levels of his being might just be an act of sovereign power and strength on the part of God. It's at least conceivable that what happens in Christ is that God takes the suffering of the world into his very being in order there to conquer it. And if that act of willing leading to conditioning of some sort were eternalized, then it is anything but self-evident that it would entail change in God's being when it does, in fact, take place in time. In any event, the real issue raised by the term impassibility has to do with whether God is capable of suffering. This is the point at which modern conceptions of God often clash dramatically with ancient ones. So how did the ancients handle the question of divine suffering? And what conception of the incarnate life of God could allow them to uphold and preserve impassibility? Notwithstanding Paul Gabrilliuk's claim that one finds nothing amounting to a doctrine or a universally endorsed body of teaching, unquote, on the subject of impassibility in pre-Nicene theology, the truth is, the main lines along which the later Orthodox would handle the challenges presented to that concept by Christology were already laid down in a treatise by Gregory Thaumaturgus, the wonder worker, in the mid-third century. Gregory Thaumaturgus was a student of origins. He was the bishop of Neo-Caesarea in Pontus, an area on the southern shore of the Black Sea and just north of Cappadocia, both of which are to be found today within the borders of Turkey. He was celebrated in Gregory of Nyssa's biography of him quite simply as the teacher. He is a saint of the Catholic Church and highly regarded amongst the Orthodox. Gregory Thaumaturgus's great virtue lies in the fact that he understood full well that the passion and death of Jesus Christ might well seem to call into question the doctrine of divine impassibility. And so he expends considerable effort to show why this is not the case. Central to his argument is the belief that it is in name only that the incarnate God, quote, participated in the visible resemblance of mortal beings. When, therefore, we hear that God suffered by his coming to death, we should realize that he did not take on any of the sufferings of death, but met death immortally and impassively by the power of his authority and came back from death as God who can do everything. Therefore, he says, God enters the gates of death without knowing death, unquote. God, we might say, encountered death in the death of Jesus Christ, but he remained untouched by it. What Bruce Marshall says of Thomas Aquinas is just as true of Gregory Thaumaturgus. Marshall writes, 
Just because God is impassable, he destroys death by tasting it. Destroys death, as it were, on contact, unquote. To affirm that divine impassibility is therefore to say that God is insensible to suffering. That's again Gregory's phrase. Much rather did he subject the passions themselves to passion and cause suffering itself to suffer. Again, quoting Gregory, For the impassable one became the suffering of the passions, inflicting suffering on them by the fact that impassibility manifested itself as his impassibility in his passion. For what the passions do to those who are passable, the same thing he, the impassable one, did to the passions themselves by his passion. In that by his impassibility, suffering occurred to the passions. Unquote. Clearly, for Gregory, impassibility means to be lifted above all passion. Impassibility means that God experiences no perturbations in his being. To say then, as Gabrilio is wont to do, that impassibility means only that in giving himself over to death, God is not conquered by it, is to fail to penetrate deeply enough. Everyone who believes in the resurrection would say that much. What is decisive is the explanation given for this claim. For Gregory, God triumphs over death in that he remains insensible to it and, in this sense, untouched by it. Gavrilyuk's often fascinating monograph seeks to establish the predominance amongst the orthodox of a highly nuanced, modified version of impassibility, which would not rest satisfied with the explanation just given by Gregory. He does so by means of a close reading of Cyril of Alexandria's claim that in the death of Christ, God, quote-unquote, suffered impassively. Gavrilia concludes that the Logos is indeed the subject of the human sufferings of Christ without detriment to his impassibility. Whether this constitutes a real advance over against what we have already found in Gregory Thaumaturgos remains to be seen, however. I will return to Gavrilyuk's reading of Cyril in my fifth lecture on Christology. For now, it is sufficient to note that even if Gavrilyuk were right about Cyril, it is anything but clear that earlier fathers did not embrace what he calls an unqualified impassibilism, which would make Cyril to be rather exceptional. It should be noted before leaving Gregory Thaumaturgus that the thought that the divine being of the Logos kills death on contact, to use again Marshall's phrase, invites and allows for what I would call an instrumentalization of the human nature of Christ. One could stoutly insist that the Logos is the subject of the human sufferings of Christ without surrendering Gregory's definition of impassibility as non-affectivity through the affirmation of a thoroughgoing instrumentalization of the human nature. The explanation for this claim is as follows. If it were the case that the Logos relates to his human nature in the modality of pure activity, constantly acting through and upon his human nature, an understanding which a divinization soteriology certainly invites, then a communication of human attributes and the experiences like suffering which they make possible to the person of the union would have been rendered impossible. And even if one added to this basic doctrinal structure the thought that the Logos temporarily suspended the exercise of his power in relation to the human nature so as to allow his flesh to suffer death, such suspension would not yield a divine affectivity if it is the case that the simple and impassable Son of God kills death on contact. A lot would depend, obviously, on what a given theologian thinks to be entailed by the so-called doctrine of appropriations. That is, how he or she understands the Logos to have appropriated human attributes and experiences in order to make them his own. But there is, in fact, precedent prior to <coughs> Cyril 
uh, for a way of thinking about appropriations which would not yield a realistic ascription of human attributes and experiences to the person of the Logos in the sense that most people think of it today. Athanasius is my case in point. When Athanasius ascribes suffering to the word, he means that the body offered up to death by the word is the body assumed into union with himself. As such, Athanasius says, it belongs to him, to the Logos, and may rightly be said to be his. By extension, whatever takes place in that body may also be said to be his. On this showing, then, the statement that God suffers in Christ according to the human nature would not mean that the divine word is the direct subject of human suffering, but that the word made the sufferings that remain localized in his body to be his own through his assumption of the nature in which they take place. Is the doctrine of appropriations which is erected on this soil commensurate with realistic ascription? Only to the extent that realistic ascription is itself limited to the thought of a mere possession of the human nature, but not in the more fulsome sense given to such realism in the writings of Luther and of modern theologians working in the shadow of Hegel. In any event, I don't think there can be any question but that Athanasius' understanding of impassibility is unqualified in Gavrilio's sense. My point is this. It is not at all necessary to conclude that wherever you find talk of God suffering according to or in his human nature, that there you have evidence of what Gavrilio calls a qualified impassibility, leading to an equally qualified passibility. It could, in fact, be the case, as I have just shown, that such a statement is fully compatible with the affirmation of an unqualified impassibility. My own conviction is that the second of these possibilities was the dominant view not only in the early church but right on through the post-Reformation period. Departures from it would have to be regarded as exceptional. <coughs> Turning then to the role played by simplicity in the construction of the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, the second major heading. I'm actually nearing the end. <clears throat> My contention in this section is not original. It can, in fact, be found in Lewis Ayer's magisterial study of the development of Trinitarian theology in the fourth century. The contention is this. Divine simplicity exercised a controlling influence on the debate which led to the formulation of the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity at the Council of Constantinople in 381. Both sides to the Eunomian controversy embraced this conception. The difference had to do with the question of whether the one simple divine essence is rightly identified with the Father alone, which was the case with Eunomius, or whether it is shared in an undivided way by all three members of the Trinity, which is what the Cappadocians held. Basil found a way to say the latter without introducing division and composition into the divine essence, which testifies to the importance simplicity had for him as well. His famous terminological distinction between essence and hypostases made the former alone to be an answer to the question of the whatness of God, the latter, hypostases, being made to answer the questions of how and that. The how question was answered in terms of differing modes of origination, which add nothing to the whatness of God. To speak of thatness, on the other hand, is simply a way of saying that the divine essence is not an empty abstraction, but that it is con concretely instantiated here, here, and here, in three distinct persons. That the differentiation of persons did not divide the essence was guaranteed by the claim that the generation of the Son was immaterial and incomprehensible, as well as by what Ayers calls the principle of inseparable operations. The meaning of this last phrase is that if one member of the Trinity does something, they all do it. There being in the triune God but one mind, one will, and one energy of operation which proceeds from the Father through the Son to the Holy Spirit. In this way, the unity of the Godhead, as guaranteed by simplicity, was given a much higher profile than was the differentiation of persons. 
Ayers is right to say that pro-Nicene discussion of the divine persons remains highly austere. But even that doesn't go far enough. Radha Galvitz comes closer to the truth, I think, when he says, Basil simply does not tell us what that which he comes to call a hypothesis is. Nor can he, without falling into a serious logical problem, as John Baer notes, and Roddy Galvitz quotes him, it is impossible to give a general definition of hypothesis, unquote. The logical difficulties referred to in this passage have to do once again with the fact that essence or substance alone defines, or gives an answer to the what question, which means that the word hypothesis cannot be pressed to give an answer to that question. And again, to speak of modes of origination does not define anything, not even persons. Even the terms father and son do not do this, since they do nothing more than point us back to the differing modes of origination. On the other hand, the orthodox solution created by the Cappadocians would have left Athanasius in a perilous position had he not signed on to it. For his inclination right into the late 350s had been to make father and son proper names of God and as such proper to the divine essence. Were this the case, the triune relations would begin to make uh, would begin to look like a definition of God's essence and hence make God composite. Which is also why Athanasius was long suspected of having modalistic tendencies by theologians operating in the East. Clearly, simplicity played a major role in the articulation of the orthodox understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. What I would like to suggest before concluding this lecture is that the creed which secured the victory of pro-Nicene theology was in fact rather minimalist in its claims, which gives those of us who worry about the role played by simplicity and its corollary term impassibility in the classical doctrine of God a good bit of wiggle room. I'm going to have more to say about this when I turn to my own construction of the doctrine of the imminent trinity, but this much may be said for the moment. The primary teaching of the creed is to be found in the substantial unity of Father and Son. Though that is not directly said of the Spirit, it may be taken as implied by the affirmation that the Spirit is to be, quote, worshipped and glorified together with the Father and the Son, unquote. That the Son is consubstantial, homoousios with the Father, means that they are equal in dignity. Moreover, the Son is begotten, not made. The begetting of the Son is thus eternal. Nothing is said in the Creed, however, with respect to the nature of the begetting or the nature of the Spirit's possession, not even that they are incomprehensible or that they are necessary, though the authors undoubtedly believe this to be the case. Nothing is said with respect to divine simplicity or impassibility. Also missing is an affirmation of the principle of inseparable operations. Lewis Ayers would like to argue that what is or is not, what is or ought to be, excuse me, authoritative in theology today is not the creed alone, but the pro-Nicene theology which stands behind it. In fact, he is not all that interested in the creed as such. He thinks it unlikely that the Council of Constantinople was even intended to be a universal council. He suggests that this may be the reason that no acts of the council survive and that our text of the creed itself comes from the Council of Chalcedon 70 years after the fact. What Ayers really wants is for theology today to be done on a foundation laid in pro-Nicene theology. He puts it this way. I understand pro-Nicene theology to be functioning as an authority when its basic principles are treated as a foundation for subsequent theological reflection and its theologians as a constant point of departure in the articulation of Trinitarian belief in subsequent periods and cultural contexts." Ayers understands inseparable operations to be one of those principles, and he understands divine simplicity to be its foundation. Which means, I take it, that one cannot, on his view, be pro-Nicene today without affirming divine simplicity. Now, Ayers is a good Catholic theologian. He is certainly within his rights to acknowledge a high level of doctrinal authority in the doctors of the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. 
But for a Protestant like me, it is the creed which is authoritative. And authoritative through an official act of reception by a particular Protestant church. Put another way, it is the creed as interpreted by the confessions, confessions of one's own church that is authoritative. And even then, this authority is a human limited authority which remains reformable as a matter of principle. The principle being sola scriptura. No absolute commitment to the terminology of the creed, extra biblical as much of it is, is implied by Protestant adherence to the creed. If we can say the same thing in other words, then we are free to do so. Doctors of the church are, however, an altogether different matter. Individual theologians are free to prize highly the work of other individual theologians, past and present, and to allow them influence over their own work. But doctors have no official standing in Protestant churches. One last point, and I will conclude. Not all Catholic theologians would agree with Ayer's contention that pro-Nicene theology should exercise the authority today that he would like. Many, in fact, do not. Ayers gives an implicit acknowledgement of this fact in that he suggests, we might better say accuses, some very well-known and highly placed Catholic theologians of having been infected by the modern Protestant disease on his way out the door, so to speak, which is to say in his concluding chapter. It's not just Karl Rahner who comes in for criticism here. Hans Urs von Balthasar does as well, as does Walter Kosper, until very recently the president of the Catholic Council on Church Unity, in other words, the chief ecumenical officer of the Catholic Church. John Zazulis is too modern as well, notwithstanding the fact that he was made a metropolitan of the Greek Church only after having published the works that draw the most fire from heirs. All of this is to say, disaffected Protestants might wish to believe that what they are getting from heirs is the very best Catholic theology, but that's not a conviction that every Catholic theologian would share. Conclusion. The directionality of early church reflection on God moved from oneness, as understood in the light of simplicity and impassibility, to the differentiation of persons. Such a procedure was inevitable, given the challenges faced by the fathers and the intellectual conditions under which they did their work. But it has to be said that it's not the procedure of the New Testament writers. New Testament faith takes its rise with the affirmation that the man Jesus is God. To say that a human being somehow belongs to the identity of the one God of Israel, which is the conclusion to which the creedal affirmation Jesus is Lord leads us, is to move from difference to a reaffirmation of the received doctrine of oneness, not the other way around. I will expand on this point at some length in the fourth lecture on New Testament materials. But the real difficulty in early church reflection on God lies in the fact <clears throat> that it's thinking about the triune God was so massively impacted by the concepts of simplicity and impassibility. What makes this state of affairs questionable is not the fact that the terms are extra-biblical. It's not that. Theologians in all ages borrow philosophical terminology in their efforts to grasp the meaning and significance of biblical teaching and to communicate that teaching with clarity to the world they live in. And they're right to do so. No, what makes this procedure questionable is the fact that the content of the concepts clashes with significant strands of biblical teaching, so that the concepts themselves begin to look alien to the thought world of the biblical writers. And it will not do, it seems to me, in an effort to save the appearances where these concepts are concerned to appeal to the fact that the Septuagint was the Bible of the New Testament writers in order to justify the claim that passages like Exodus 3.14 invite their employment. The reason is twofold. First, New Testament writers like Paul cite passages from the Old Testament not only from the Greek translation, but also from Hebrew. So it would be a gross exaggeration to say that the Septuagint 
with the Bible of the New Testament writers. And second, the New Testament writers show no interest whatsoever, as far as I can see, in the concepts of simplicity and impassibility. Instead, they speak rather artlessly of the crucifixion of the Lord of glory, for example, in 1 Corinthians 2.8, just to give one common example, without giving any indication that such talk might be regarded as problematic in some quarters. No doubt, a passage like 1 Corinthians 2.8 can be explained in such a way as to bring it into line with a commitment to impassibility. Once the two natures logic of Chalcedon is in place and discussion of the communication of attributes which the Chalcedonian definition engendered is fully underway. But all of that came later, after simplicity and impassibility had been awarded a supervisory role in the construction of the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, and after the bishops at Chalcedon had formulated a Christology which preserved their inviolability. To appeal to a specific understanding of the communication of attributes, then, in order to preserve simplicity and impassibility, is to use the entire doctrinal edifice generated by those concepts to defend the concepts themselves. A self-enclosed, question-begging maneuver, at the very least. Reminds me, back in the uh, 1980s, during the Iran-Contra scandal, President Reagan asked Edwin Meese to conduct an investigation when he, in fact, was himself the one carrying out the cover-up. Anyway. In the next lecture, I will turn to an examination of modern treatments of the doctrine of God in their historical development. My contention will be that, diverse as those treatments often are, they are set forth with the intention of bringing reflection on God more into line with scriptural teaching than early church reflection had been. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Uh, we've just been hearing about a story of how the doctrine of God in its classical theistic form came to be. And storytellers have a lot of authority. They shape the way we uh, think about things. And uh, if I heard you rightly, you're always hermeneutical. <laughs> if I heard you rightly, this was a story of um, Christianity being Hellenized, and I, you know, maybe we could start off with maybe a quick reflection on what you think of uh, Gilson's suggestion that you could tell the story as the Christianization of Hellenism. I would really be interested in knowing what the difference is in outcome between a Christianization of Hellenism and a Hellenization of Christianity. How do they look different on the ground? Uh, well, we cheer for one and not so much for the other. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just say this. Um, when I was a student at, uh, in the History of Doctrine at Princeton Seminary, in those days we were required to read all the great histories of doctrine. That is, those that, that covered the entire waterfront. We were required to read Adolf von Hanark. We were required to read Reinhold Zeber, Friedrich Schloss. Uh, we were required to read Yaroslav Pelikan. Um, we were trained in all periods in the history of doctrine. Um, I actually had more training and was better prepared to do patristics than I was to do modern theology simply because I took almost half of my seminars in the patristic area. Um, that's all. That's all a way of saying I. I don't recognize Otto von Harnack in a great deal of the criticism that is made today of the Hellenization thesis. Um, Paul Gabrilio describes um, the Hellenization thesis as a fall into Greek philosophy. Von Harnack never used the word fall. In fact, he doesn't even speak of corruption. Here's what his, his famous formula is. Dogma in its conception and development is a work of the Greek spirit on the soil of the gospel. You can tell I was thinking that this question would come up. Dogma in its conception and development is a work of the Greek spirit on the soil of the gospel. The dogma in view here is the Logos Christology, which would provide the foundation for the construction of the Orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. It is above all the Logos Christology, which he says, and he's thinking of Justin and Clement and Origen, 
It is the Logos Christology, which is the work of the Greek spirit on the soil of the gospel. And, I think, it would be hard to dispute such a claim when seen in the light of synoptic research, especially. It should also be noted, as I said earlier, that von Harnock did not describe the process of Hellenization in terms of a fall. He himself noted that the meaning of this of his own formula had often been misrepresented, even in his own time, by those who suppressed the words on the soil of the gospel. And he continued, and I quote, but those words are decisive for me. The foolishness of identifying dogma and Greek philosophy never entered my mind. Unquote. Of von Harnack's magisterial seven-volume history, Yaroslav Pelikan was to write, quote, superseded but never surpassed, Harnock's work remains after 80 years the one interpretation of early Christian doctrine with which every other scholar must contend. Unquote. Now, I had no reference to von Harnock in anything I did in this particular lecture. I was only working with the very best of recent patristic research. And it seems to me that the very best of recent patristic research by specialists working in that field all gives evidence to some form or another of the Hellenization thesis. It may not be exactly von Harnock's. They've corrected him on a lot of details, but it's all continuous with it. I mean, read, read Justin on the Logos and ask yourself, is this simply the, the Johannine Logos concept? No. Go for it, Kelly. Uh, please feel free to line up behind a microphone and ask your questions. I'll walk over here. <laughs> One question, actually. Um, so, I, I think you're right about all of what you just said. Um, Hellenization is a fact for current patristics. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. No, no. Well, I think that people writing the things you're writing or reading are, think it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, and, and I hope you noticed that along the way, I also said that this is what had to be done in that right. time and place. And right. I respect it. So that my question has to do more with when you turn to the biblical material, because um, if you just take Martin Hengel, I mean, where do you stand with respect to the idea that there never was a pure Palestinian Judaism that produced yeah. the New Testament? That's, that's my question, because it seems like... Um, in order for your trajectory, your story to work, yeah. there has to be some pure moment. Before. No, there doesn't. Okay. Not at all. I mean, to say, to say that what I just said, that New Testament writers did not take any explicit interest in the concepts of simplicity and impassibility, is or is not correct. It's a statement of fact which either is or is not correct. And it doesn't require a distinction between uh, something that's conceptually pure, call it Judaic, and Hellenism. It, it, it entails no playing off of Hellenism against Judaism. Okay. I, I'm very well aware of the conditions in first century Palestine. Okay. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, I wasn't always able to notice when you were shifting between historical narrative and evaluative um, comment. And particularly, it seemed to me that um, you told a story throughout the body of the paper, and then when you introduced the conclusion, then you raised several objections to the doctrines you had been discussing. I actually didn't hear much argument in that conclusion, which, not surprisingly, coming in conclusions, they don't normally get that. Yeah. Perhaps you're going to deal with that later in lectures? Which, I will. Okay, yeah. The argument comes in the New Testament material primarily, and then considerably more in the constructive work. Okay. Okay. Um, with that, I, I, I will be curious, and I'm guessing several of us will be. It's one thing to say that they're not New Testament writers aren't making explicit statements, are not consciously aware of these doctrines. Um, it strikes me as something quite different to say that those doctrines are inconsistent with, or even in tension with, what's in the text. So I'll, I'll just be interested in that. Yeah. Um. I'll be interested in, in, in seeing how you respond to the New Testament lecture because I have done everything in my power to make sure that where consensus, consensus, a consensus exists on particular questions in New Testament studies that I identify them as such. 
In other words, just as I tried to say everything I said to, in this lecture on the basis of what current patristic research has to say about the subjects I'm treating, I do the same in the New Testament area. Steve. Thank you very much, Dr. McCormack. I, I appreciated that. Bruce I, is fine. Okay, great. We only, we've only emailed, so. Um, um, Kevin's, Kevin's question to me strikes a, a kind of significant divide in contemporary theology, which is not really Protestant and Catholic. And that is to say, what is the problem where we're, we're working on? Yeah. And in some sense, it seems to me that your problem, even though you find appreciation of the Hellenization thesis, that's the problem. I'd like to return to Ayer's last chapter, where he chides contemporary theologians for avoiding the he Hegelianization thesis. Now, you began by saying, and I think rightly, that after Hegel, all modern theology begins with the doctrine of the Trinity. However, and I'm sure you would agree with this, it is at most, as Cyril O'Regan has said, heterodox, or as William Desmond, a counterfeit double. And therefore, it also is a temptation, um, this, this, this Hegelianization, which, of course, you can jettison simplicity and impassibility quite easily with this account of the doctrine of the Trinity. And, and here's my concern, as someone who's much more worried about the Hegelianization than the Hellenization. That is, how are you not going to tacitly underwrite the secularization thesis? That is to say, if God in God's divinity suffers, then how do I know God is not dead? As, in fact, the most consistent Hegelian thinker, Slavoj Žižek, has persuasively argued, beginning with Luther's account of the crucifixion, although I would say it's a bad account of Luther's understanding, but having jettisoned impassibility and saying God suffers, God dies. Otherwise, you've equivocated because the damnable problem with suffering is that it ends with death because there is a passion I suffer over which I have no control. Because I have a potentiality that has to be actualized, which, of course, Hegel also admitted in section 776 of the philosophy of spirit when he spoke of God's second son, that pure potentiality, the devil. So I, I don't see how you're going to avoid the conclusion of, in fact, what, what, what Christianity really brings to the world if God suffers is God is dead and we have killed him. Two things. The first is, no, three things. The first is the claim that God is dead and that that's the end of the story not only defies the New Testament witness since it continues on to a resurrection, um, it also ties us to Hegel to a degree that I would not myself be comfortable with. Okay. But the second thing I would say immediately upon saying that is the Hegelianization of theology is not the evil for me that it is for you. And the fact that Hegel got a number of things wrong including, for example, the resurrection, which is a quite crucial piece, uh, does not prevent me from seeing what else is at stake in what he's doing. I mentioned last night that uh, I had never met Kenneth Concert. I did read, meet Carl Henry at the Rutherford House in Edinburgh, and my strongest impression on the basis of that meeting was that this man was a true gentleman, a true Christian gentleman in the sense that he really sought hard to understand the positions of others that he did not agree with on their own terms before registering a criticism. It's not clear at all to me that people who criticize Hegel and Schelling and Schleiermacher, etc., have really engaged their writings on a very deep level. Now, O'Regan is certainly a, an exception. Uh, he's a friend of mine, and I, and I tend to think uh, he's just simply wrong on this. Um, I think Hegel's own self-understanding was not far from the truth. Hegel understood himself, if you read the preface to the Lectures on Philosophy of Religion, as defending Orthodox Christianity at a time when he thought theologians had abandoned the task. He's very self-conscious about that. Are the results heterodox? Yeah. But heterodox doesn't necessarily mean heretical. It means other. It means you push the boundaries. And it could well be that somebody else who comes along after cleans up the mess you created and does a better job of it. But it doesn't mean they didn't have important insights, as I will demonstrate in the next lecture this afternoon. 
I didn't deny any of that. Yeah, I know. Everything you said. Good. Uh, except uh, uh, Cyril O'Regan, I mean, I mean, but um, about how his reading of Hegel. But I don't think he answered the question, if God suffers, how does suffering in God not lead to death? If God suffers in God's divinity... If you ask the question without assuming the existence of two natures Christology, then it can't be answered. But if you believe in the two natures, and you do, then the answer to the question is, the experience of death and suffering is a human experience. And to be a Hegelian in my terms would simply mean understanding this human experience as an event in God's own life. That is to say, God does not die in the literal sense of ceasing to exist. God experiences the human experience of death and suffering, and in the resurrection, conquers it in Himself. So, Shija? That, that seems like it restates the doctrine of impassibility. Huh, not in the least. Oh, because how does it matter if we see? Stick around for the next five minutes. It <laughs> 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 not even close. <laughs> To, to, say, to say that God is the subject of human experiences, directly the subject is not to, to revert to Athanasius' ploy of saying that God possesses the human nature and therefore what takes place in it is his. It says he suffers, but he suffers humanly. Okay? It's a human experience. It's death in God, not the end of God. That's a... You can. Um, I believe this would be a more general, general question. Um, do you believe there is a golden age in Christianity, or do you believe there will be one if not? If not? And uh, um, how do we, as Protestants, we still are protesting? Do we protest defensively or aggressively against something? I'm glad you asked that question because I was very dissatisfied with the answer I gave to Kevin Van Hooser last night. Um, Kevin wanted to know what we can do to try to revitalize uh, core Protestant beliefs. And I think the more major response I want to give is it's no longer possible to simply repeat the defenses of those doctrines given in past centuries because the challenges that are being brought against them today are new challenges. The problem that we're facing right now is that most Protestants, and here I mean even advocates of those core beliefs, don't understand them well enough to realize the full potential contained in them so that they are able to address new challenges as they arise. We need to be adapted. We need to be able to articulate them in new and fresh ways, which takes seriously the very real moral challenges, which is where it's coming from, to, to forensic thinking in our time. And if we don't do that, then don't be surprised if the kids that you teach just tune you out. They will. They hear a better story across the street. So, we need to think creatively and freshly. I just have a, a few questions, Bruce, uh, for clarification. Um, I suppose it's obvious that you don't like the notion of divine simplicity. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me, let me, can I explain to you very quickly why? Sure. I believe that Jesus, the man, was God. And if that's the case, I don't see how composition in God can be simply eliminated. Okay. You'll, you'll get all that in my Christology, but that's the short yeah, answer. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I won't be here for that. Oh, you should watch it on live streaming. <laughs> but um, well, let me continue to ask questions then. Um, and pardon me if, well, my presupposition, the only way we can speak about God, I think you agree with this, but perhaps on different terms, the only way we as creatures can speak of God is analogically. Right? Mm. So you're not opposed to understanding that the notion of the divine essence is something for us as creatures that is incomprehensible, are you? I'm not opposed to, say it again. You're not opposed to the notion that the divine essence is to us as creatures incomprehensible. It all depends on what you mean by incomprehensible. If, if it means complete definition, then yes. If it means we can know nothing of it, then no. 
Okay, so I would agree God, God can be known but not comprehended as God comprehends God's self, correct? As God comprehends God's self, no. Does that mean that we cannot participate in God's knowledge of himself? No. All right. Certainly we can. All right. So, so if, if, if that's the case, um, then according to our analogical predication of the divine being, and I, I'm, I wasn't aware, so I'd have to think more. I don't think there's a difference between divine substance and divine essence, but so I'll just... Yeah, it's an interesting, it's a courageous attempt that Andrew makes, and I applaud it uh, on the level of trying to find a creative solution to a problem, but I don't think it finally works. Right. But if, if we take, um, do, do you think then that there is a distinction in God, uh, for God as God is, between God's essence and the divine persons? Do I think that there is a distinction between what God is and the person? As God, as God is, is there a distinction between the divine essence and the divine persons? I would define the divine essence as the persons in their totality. In other words, I wouldn't front load essence language. I would make essence a description of God's being in the eternal act of election. Okay, so which is his triunity. There's no distinction then, correct? On of the kind that you want to make, no. I don't want to make that distinction, God forbid. <laughs> so getting then to the point of divine simplicity, thus far we are affirming that God is simple, aren't we? Define what you mean. That there's no composite in the divine being if there is no distinction between the divine person and the, the divine person. What I'm going to say in my constructive move is that I think the determination for incarnation is a personal property of the second person of the Trinity. And as such, composition cannot simply be ruled out of court in our descriptions of the eternal being of God. But where is the composition? Is the composition... That's a Christological question, and it has to do precisely with the relationship of the human nature to the person of the union. Yes, in the hypostatic union, exactly. obviously, there's composition. And I'm going to run that very differently than anything you've ever seen before. <laughs> well, let's... Father, Son, and Spirit together, right? And, okay, I, I don't want to get into eternal election right now, but um, just, just bear with me. If there is no composition between the divine persons and the divine essence, correct? Then we have divine simplicity, which gets to, I'll put it in colloquial language, gets to the godness of God. Not so much a Greek concept, but something I think quite biblical in terms of God simply is, right? The only distinction, it seems to me, in the divine life is between the persons that is real in God. And yet those divine persons are identical to the divine essence. So there's no, so divine simplicity, in fact, is preserved yeah. at the uncreated level, which is never the case, never yeah. the case at the created level. Even in our own participation through grace, whether you understand that in terms of created grace or divinization, uncreated energies. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me try to help you by skipping ahead to a claim I'm going to make. I think the Logos relates eternally to his human nature in the modality of receptivity. That is to say, not activity, as Cyril would have it, but receptivity. And that that receptivity is itself ontologically, ontologically constitutive of what it means to be God in his second mode of being. And therefore, when I say what you just said, it's going to come out different. I mean, we could say the same statement and mean something very different by it. If I said Father, Son, and Spirit are together the divine essence, I would mean something different than you do because the second person of the Trinity has a name. His name is Jesus Christ, and it's not an abstract son. And neither See, the difference between us is finally you're thinking about all of these terms in accordance with the metaphysics of the ancient church, and I've eliminated that frame of reference completely. So it's very hard for you to understand what I'm talking about, because we often use the same terminology, and we seem to converge, and then suddenly the ground 
seems to go out from underneath your feet. And the only way you could understand it finally, Ralph, is to stick through the hole and see where it goes. You might still disagree, but you probably wouldn't be asking me questions that I could only answer by giving up my, my uh, frame of reference altogether. Okay. I, I, I will have to listen, but I, I, I just want to put one qualifier. I'll admit that I'm working with well, not just the ancient metaphysics, but the medieval metaphysics. Yeah. I, I believe this is a necessary step. But, but even apart from that, it seems to me that our confession, Jesus is Lord, um, has to comport with the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one, mm -hmm. or the Lord alone. So there is an implicit metaphysical move there in which composition in God to be able to state something about the divine economy would violate the most ancient confession it's of not, faith that the biblical tradition gives that that's us. the only possible interpretation of that passage. I mean, it could simply mean that God alone is God. Adding to that non-composition, well, it might be in there, but who's to say? I mean, the, the statement itself is not self-evident in its meaning. The reason you think that is because you think in terms of a later metaphysic. <coughs> we, will, we will continue this conversation. Thanks. I think the salient point uh, is that it helps to stay for the long term to learn a foreign language. <laughs> but uh, for those of you who can't stay, we'll be making Rosetta Stone of McCormack language available in due course. Uh, so I do think you're right. I do think you're right. We're, we're using the same language, but we're divided by a similar language because I think he's working with a different metaphysical framework that we're all I'm, trying I'm not to. working with a metaphysical framework at all. Hi, Hanawen. <laughs> Different framework. For sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope you understand this. I mean, I, I don't mean this simply as a criticism, but in any discussion, if a person puts a question to another person, and the other person shares nothing of the presuppositions out of which that question emerges, then he or she can answer the question as posed only by falsifying the frame of reference in which they're working. And so, from my point of view, it's just an illegitimate question. And until you, you, you're, you're willing to grant that there are, there is at least, it's at least conceivable that there might be other frames of reference than your own, then you can't possibly even begin to think of another one. Pretty self-evident. Just as a, as a follow-up to that, and thinking back to last evening, it, it maybe I misunderstood. It seemed like one of the criticisms of evangelical theology as commonly practiced, and I think you we could broaden that beyond evangelical theology. This is not sufficiently attentive to the Christian tradition and a, a sufficiently attuned to the metaphysics involved there. Um, so I took you to be saying theologians today should be engaged with that tradition, and indeed yeah. I take today's lecture to be that. Yeah. But I hear also it seems like you saying that when people ask questions out of that metaphysic out of that framework, those are illegitimate questions? And I, I guess it's I'm just illegitimate, about that. It's an illegitimate question to try to force someone to make a choice between two alternatives, which themselves are created by a ground or starting point that they don't share. You know? You're going to hear this again when I get to freedom and necessity and God. The way, the way in which those terms are normally defined, they're defined on the basis of a particular metaphysic that I don't share. And so I can't grant you the legitimacy of the definitions in order to agree with your claim that I have to choose between them. I say to you, no, I don't. I don't have to choose between those definitions at all. I don't think they're accurate. Well, I, I mean, I understand <laughs> that. I also think that to the extent, perhaps this is good for all of us to understand, I think the extent to which both sides, though, are willing to stop the conversation at that point, yeah. it does end up as a conversation stopper. No, it doesn't. I mean, why would it? If, if I say to you, Look, don't you find it at least interesting that I define these terms differently? Is that not worthy of your consideration, at least for a few seconds of your day? I mean, isn't I that a question and response on your part? Yeah, I think that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> my, my point is that when you were, maybe I'm not making it clearly enough, but when you, on the one hand, seem to expect us and, in fact, require us to 
think in terms of the way the Christian tradition has dealt with this, and then on the other hand, think that questions from that metaphysic somehow are illegitimate. Yeah. It, it does create a it does create a, a, a bit of a tension in even how to have a conversation. Well, all I can say is um, in lecture four, I'm going to try to ground all of this biblically. Good. And when I do, I hope that the response is is not. Well, the whole cadre of biblical scholars has capitulated to modern Protestant thinking, and we're not to trust any of them. I hope it's not that. At the risk of being a conversation stopper, we do have another <laughs> session today.